All right. Now we're live. Let's see what we can get going today. What is it that we're going to do today? We're going to answer your questions. We're going to answer your questions live, whatever questions you've got about visas, U.S. visas, applying for the U.S. visa. We'll wait for a few more people to get in here and then I'm going to introduce myself and we'll get started. If you've got questions, go ahead, start dropping your questions in the comments and I'm going to answer your questions. All right. So if we do have any questions, we'll get them going. I'm going to introduce myself to people since this is going to be stored later. And everyone should know who I am. My name is Ben. I'm a former visa officer. I work for the State Department in the U.S. government in embassies and consulates around the world for many years. And after that, I entered the private sector and started helping people like you get their visas issued. Okay. So if you do have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Okay, we got a few people in here. I'll introduce myself again. I'm Ben, I'm a former visa officer, worked all around the world doing visas for many years for the State Department, and now I help people get their visas issued. So let's see, we have uh, someone who says that they forgot to renew their visa after three years. What will be different when you go in for another visa? Well, if your visa expired less than four years ago, then you're eligible to submit your application uh, in certain locations, uh, still with visa interview waiver, you can submit it and you won't have to go in for your interview. If you're not in one of those locations, however, and the time period during which you can renew your visa without going for an interview has expired, you still have to go in for an interview. It's not a bad thing that you did not renew your visa on time. There's no on time. You renew your visa whenever you want to renew it, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. It just will mean another interview. And during that interview, it'll be just like any other visa interview. However, they will see that you were previously issued a visa. And if you used it well, you didn't misuse your visa at all, you traveled with it and returned to your country, then actually having that visa issued in the past is really going to help you. <clears throat> it's not going to be a negative, it's going to be a positive. So we've got someone else that says that their case is taking forever at NVC, the National Visa Center. So if you have a petition-based visa, that can be either a work visa or an immigrant visa, it's going to go to the National Visa Center, NVC, where it's processed before it goes out to the consulate or the embassy where you're going to have your interview. There are wait times for many countries because there are a lot of people from the countries applying for visas, those wait times can be up to 20 years in the case of some countries like the Philippines, for instance. Uh, in other cases, it's just the administrative time that it takes the workers there at NBC 
to work through this catalog of this backlist of, of uh, visa applications that they've got and to get it out to post. So COVID obviously slowed everything down, um, but they are still working through your case. So it hasn't been forgotten. It's going to arrive at post and you'll be able to do your interview. <clears throat> Hello, Peter Block from Jakarta. Good morning to you as well, T-Bomb. Okay, so as Jeska says, I need to get the visa for my father who's 70 years old. What will be the requirements from him? Well, uh, he's 70 years old and usually what that means is that they are, uh, that's a high issuance visa demographic. Older people usually travel to the US and then return to their countries. The only thing that's going to complicate his visa application is if he has his children living in the US. If he's just going for tourism, then it's going to be pretty easy for him. But if his children are living in the US, it's going to depend on their status in the US, right? If they are there, um, in a in a in, in the capacity of being let's say citizens, then he needs to demonstrate that listen I can get a, a green card petition approved at any time to go live with my children, but I don't want to. That's not my plan. I just want to visit from time to time and come back to my country. If the children who are in the U.S. are there on any other type of temporary visa and they want to visit, that's when it's going to be able, be a little bit harder to demonstrate. Okay, what are the children doing in the U.S. Are they staying in status? Do they have the intent to stay permanently in the U.S. or not? And that's going to determine the outcome of his, his visa interview. Okay, someone asks, Kavan3250 asks if I can say anything about the J-1 visa. Uh, well, the J-1 visa, I'm not going to explain what it is. I assume you know what the J-1 visa is. But in terms of the interview, what you need to focus on in the J-1, there are different types of J-1s, but all of them have some program that you're going to engage in. You need to speak expertly about this program that you're going to engage in. You need to be very confident, you need to be very knowledgeable, and you need to give information when they ask a question. When they say, what's this program? Don't just say research. Say, I'm going to conduct research into this topic because I'm interested in this and I'm going to do it at this institution underneath this advisor for this amount of time. That's, a, that's something that gives them some information. They're, they're creating in their mind a mental picture of who you are as an applicant. How reliable are you? Are you, are you a, an acclaimed, uh, renowned academic, right? Are you a prestigious researcher going to do this? Are you, are you on a career path, right? If you just give short, blunt answers, you don't give them any information to go off of. Is there less of a chance to get the visa issued in Nepal? Should we go to India for more chance? If you are Nepalese, if you are from Nepal, you should apply in Nepal if at all possible. And the reason for this is that the officers that are in Nepal are trained to interview people who are from Nepal. They've been taught the language. They've been, they've been trained in, in assessing people's economic situation, their academic situation, um, their financial situation, their professional situation, all in the context of living in Nepal. If you arrive in India, the officers in India do not know anything about Nepal. They might know a little bit, but they don't, they don't know everything. Uh, and they're not going to have as high a level of confidence when interviewing someone from Nepal. Now, this applies for almost anywhere in the world. There are certain exceptions, but if there is an embassy that's open in your country or a consulate where you can go for your visa interview, that's where you should go because that's where the officers are going to be confident when they see your application. They're going to understand what's going on. They're not going to feel like, okay, I don't understand what's happening. When the visa officers don't understand your case, they don't understand what you're telling them or what your situation is or what your plan is, that's when they don't issue your visa. They're told specifically by their managers that there's no such thing as a bad visa refusal. I completely disagree with this. I feel like if you ref refuse someone who intended to use their visa well, that's definitely a bad refusal. That's a miscarriage of your responsibilities and your, your, your mandate abroad to get people who are legitimate travelers into the US. However, that is what they're told to do. 
And so if the officer is not confident, if, they, if he or she doesn't understand your situation, they feel very fine with just refusing your visa and moving on to the next applicant. So let's see here. <clears throat> Greetings from Guatemala City. Greetings. Bienvenidos. Y también si tenemos, si hay alguien que habla español, también hablo español, por si acaso, si queremos hablar en español. Uh, so I speak Spanish and Chinese as well. Uh, so if we've got anyone that would like to, to talk in those languages, we can do that as well. We don't want to, uh, to exclude anyone. Okay. So baby baby says, I had rejected F1 visa. What should I do next to get approved? Okay. This is uh, my favorite topic to talk about because it's where I can help people the most. When you've been refused previously and you go in for your next interview, what's going to happen? The first thing is that the visa officer is going to open up your case and they're going to see immediately that you were previously refused. Now, what does this mean? It means that they're going to have a negative thought in their head from the very beginning of the interview. They're going to have a negative thought about you that, oh, my colleague refused them. I'm probably going to refuse them too. That's the first thought. You should know this. That's the first thought in their head. It doesn't matter what the reason was the first time. That's the thought that's going to be in their head. Now, what does that mean for you? That means that your task is to change their thinking as quickly as possible from thinking a negative thought about you to thinking a positive thought. And the way you do that is by answering their questions. Now, that seems very simple. Okay, well, they ask a question and you answer it. No. When they ask a question, what they're actually doing is saying, tell me why I should issue your visa. They may say, oh, what's your program in the U.S.? Why are you going to the U.S.? Where are you planning to go? Have you traveled anywhere else? Who's going to be paying for this trip? All of these questions, yes, they're very specific. But the reason they're asking them is because they're saying to you, give me some information that makes it possible for me to feel confident issuing your visa. Okay? So whatever you're asked after you've been refused previously, your answer needs to include the top qualifications that you have to convince the visa officer to issue your visa, right? Let's say in your first interview, you, uh, you went in and you didn't speak very much and you were refused. In the second interview, when you come in, they may ask you the question, what's changed since your first visa interview? Maybe it was one week ago. Maybe nothing has changed at all, but you should not say that. You can't just say, no, nothing's changed. Everything's the same. Your, your colleague who just refused me last week, nothing's changed. They had all the same information that you're going to have today and you're gonna make that decision. That's the worst thing you can say. You have to say something that's going to change their mind. So what you might say is, well, no, there's no change in my resume, but last time I didn't get the chance to tell the visa officer that I have a full scholarship. Oh, and then all of a sudden the visa officer thinks, oh wow, full scholarship. Okay, that sounds like some good information. I wonder why they would have been refused, right? So you're telling them whatever is that top piece of information that supports your visa application, right? To get them thinking. Okay, let's move on to some more questions. I had many refusals. This is from Yuri Pro. I had many refusals when I was younger, but I'm 23 now and I have my own business. Do I have a chance? Yes. If you were refused when you were younger, especially if you were a minor under the age of 18, you're not going to be held responsible for, for whatever may have happened in those interviews. How, however, that does not mean that they're just ignored. They're going to see these refusals and it reflects on your family. And they do, especially still at the age of 23, they're going to be assessing not just you, but your family. If your family appears to have the means to support tourism, travel, attending a conference, business in the U.S. without having any need to resort to staying in the U.S. unlawfully, working without authorization in the U.S., 
then they can approve your visa, right? 214B is a visa refusal code that means that the visa officer was not convinced to issue the visa. 214B, it's just the section of the law. And what it says, I don't have it memorized verbatim, but what it says is that each visa applicant has to prove to the satisfaction of the consular officer that they intend to use the visa correctly and that they have ties abroad that are going to pull them abroad after they stay in the U.S. and they're not going to stay in the U.S. permanently. I'm going to move over here just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so if you've just been refused 214B, right, and you'll know this because it's written on the piece of paper that you've been given when you were refused. If you were refused under 214B, you can still apply again. You can apply again, and there's nothing that makes it so that the next visa officer has to refuse you. They don't have to refuse you. They may, and that previous refusal will influence their thinking, but there's nothing that requires them to make that same decision. They can make a new decision. So if you've been refused in the past, you can get approved in the future. Is it easier to get a B visa if I apply from Switzerland, says <clears throat> some random username. That goes back to what I was saying before. No, it's, it's not easier if you apply from a different country, right? There are some people right now who, for instance, in Russia, there are no visa interviews. So many Russians are applying in Poland or in Kazakhstan. Uh, Iranians can't apply in Iran because there's no U.S. embassy. So they apply outside of their country. Now, even if you're applying outside of your country, there are the places that are the best places to apply. And how do you judge what's the best place to apply outside of your own country? One, it should be a place where they're going to be familiar with people from your country. Okay, so in Poland and Kazakhstan, they have a greater understanding about Russia than, let's say, in Japan. So if a Russian goes to Japan, the Japanese, the, the consular officer at the Japanese at the, at the U.S. consulate in Japan is going to think, what is the, I, I don't know anything about Russians. Why, why are they here? I'm not, I'm not certain about this. But in Kazakhstan, they're thinking, okay, well, actually many people in this country speak the same language. They have the same cultural heritage. I understand a lot about what's going on here, the customs, things like that. They're going to be confident, okay? Uh, Iranians, for instance, should always apply in Ankara, Turkey, Dubai or Yerevan, Armenia, and the reason is because that's where the State Department sends officers who they have trained to speak Farsi, which is Persian, uh, and trained to adjudicate visas for Iranians. There are a lot of regulations regarding Iranian visas. They are trained up in them, whereas if this person shows up in, let's say, Lithuania, they're never going to have seen an Iranian visa applicant before, and they're not going to be confident, they're going to be confused, and that just equals poor chances to get the visa issued. Let's see here, what do we got? Somebody says that they had two B1 and B2 visas for five years and the third one got refused. Well, something happened. In your life, in your country's situation, it could be that the way you used your visa was not in accordance with what you told the visa officer when you applied for your visa. It could be that you stayed for a long time, especially as a younger person, staying for a long time is a red flag. On the other hand, it could be something in your country. One big example is Venezuela. Many people from Venezuela had visas, 10-year visas for many, many years. And now because the situation in Venezuela has deteriorated so much economically, and security wise, the visa officers that interview Venezuelans, uh, now they can't do the interviews in Venezuela because the embassy is closed there. They are not so confident about Venezuelans intent to use their visa well. And so there's a, a lowered chance that they'll get their visa issued, even though they had visas issued in the past. <clears throat> So, official MKMK says, my brother was approved for a B1-B2 visa verbally, then administrative processing and refusal under 214B. What could this mean? What this means is that more information, negative information, 
came to the visa officer's attention after the visa interview. So during the visa interview, the visa officer was intending to issue the visa. Then afterwards, there was some information. Now, it, it was probably something that was in their computer system that wasn't available at the time of the interview, that then they asked them to do administrative processing. Maybe they asked them to submit uh, a questionnaire to fill out a lot of information and fill out a questionnaire. Uh, and then the end result of that was a 214B. This is not uncommon uh, that this information is not available to the officers at the time of the interview. Um, it is known to happen quite a bit. You say that's not right as they don't know the previous officer did right or wrong. That's true. However, you're not dealing with a legal process when you're dealing with an F visa, a B visa. Sure, there are some, the, the, the legal requirement is that you pay the visa fee, that you have a passport, right? These are the legal requirements. The main thing that you have to overcome, though, is the visa officer's suspicion. And how do you overcome the visa officer's, officer's suspicion? It's just through the conversation. That's all you have. The only thing you have is the conversation with the visa officer. And in that conversation, you have to make them feel confident. It's a psychological challenge for you to be able to present your information, your qualifications, your credentials in such a way that the visa officer feels confident that you are going to use your visa correctly. You're not going to stay in the U.S. permanently. So part of that psychological equation is all the information that the visa officer has access to. That means your passport. What country is your passport from? What stamps do you have in your passport? Oh, you've been traveling around the world internationally already. Okay. The way that you dress, the way that you speak, the way that you look, uh, the information that you put in your DS-160, the job that you have, your educational background. Have you ever been arrested? Also, your previous visa record. If you've been refused before, whether or not it was a, a justifiable refusal or anything, it psychologically affects them. So honestly, I'm going to let you know, Isha, 1982, it doesn't do any good to think about if this is fair or not. Sure, I can talk forever about what's fair and not fair, but the goal is to get the visa issued. And if we want to get the visa issued, we have to concentrate on what we can change, what we can affect. It's enough just to know this will have a negative influence on the visa officer's thinking, and then we start from there, and we, and we challenge ourselves, how can I change the visa officer's thinking, right? Thinking that it's not fair doesn't get them to change their thinking. Telling them it's not fair doesn't get them to change their thinking. Presenting new information to them in a way that makes a light bulb light up in their brain and say, huh? Hmm. Why would they get refused? This seems like a good visa applicant. That is what we have to do. That's our challenge. That's what we can take. That's the only thing that we have. Uh, we have the power to change is what we say during the next visa interview. NC Tanya Tilly says, if your parent is filing for you, what is the name of that visa? Well, that depends. If it's an immigrant visa, then that could be an F1 immigrant, not student. There's an F1 immigrant visa, or uh, it could be an IR visa uh, if it's a U.S. citizen. There, there are many different types. You'd have to give me some more information for that. Visa for credit transfer student. There's no separate visa for students who are transferring universities, there's just a student visa for attending a university. Now, your previous academic history will play a role and will affect their thinking because it's part of your academic background, but it doesn't affect the type of visa that you apply for. Is it possible to be permanently blacklisted from re renewing your B1B2 visa? Wait, when you say blacklisted, okay, so there are legal bans there's no, there's no just list where any officer can say, oh, I want to put them on that list. That doesn't exist. But there are bans. For instance, if you overstay your visa in the U.S., you accrue unlawful presence. You're in the U.S. illegally. Then you get a ban that's going to be for, uh, you know, it can, it can be uh, five years, 10 years, or 15 years, depending on the circumstances. If you were deported and went back, etc. But these are official, these bans are very official 
Uh, there's specific criteria that apply to that. One that you may uh, be talking about is 6C1, which is material misrepresentation. And what that means is that someone lied about something on their visa application, and what they lied about was something that was very important, that would change the visa officer's mind, right? That's something where you can get a ineligibility called 61, and that is a permanent ban from getting a visa. Abigail says, I was refused after having a child in America. Will I ever be given a visa? Okay, so while giving a child in the, having a child in the U.S. is not illegal, in the last five, six years, they did change the guidance to visa officers, telling them that that was no longer considered an appropriate way to use your B visa. And so that's what they're going to take into consideration when you, when you tell them that you had a child in America. Um, that also shows you know, a tie to the U.S. And it will be hard to convince them. It's not impossible because they can issue your, you your visa afterwards. There's nothing that stops a visa officer from issuing you, you your visa after having a child in America. But it's going to be much harder. It's going to be much, much harder. Okay. What advice do I have for DACA recipients? My advice is to find a good immigration attorney. You need a good immigration attorney, not the cheapest one, the best one who's going to really care about your case. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know if you're a DACA recipient in America or if you're outside of America. That is something that's key to this. Don't try to navigate that on your own. You need a good immigration attorney. That's more complicated than just a visa interview. What we do is we help with visa interviews, right? This is not, it's not a legal process. It's just, it's an interview. And then the visa officer has a judgment call to make. And that's what we can help. That's what I can help you with as a former visa officer. There are certain things though, like DACA petitions. If you're going to file a work petition, these are things that you need to speak to an immigration attorney about, right? Now, once you arrive at the interview for that, that petition-based visa, that family-based petition, or that that or that employment-based petition, whatever it may be, at that interview where the officer can use their judgment to either issue or refuse that visa to you, that's when I and my colleagues who are all ex-visa officers can help you. Someone says, what's the difference between refusal and denial? Same thing means the exact same thing. Can I get a USA visa outside of my country, asks Talibu. Yes, you can. It's harder. Now, maybe you have to go outside of your own country. Maybe you have to because the visa office is closed in your country because of the pandemic. Yes, you can go outside your country, but you need to go to the right consulate. So I already talked about the first point, which was that you need to go to a consulate where they know people from your country, where they're used to seeing people from your country show up for visa interviews. That's really, really important. The second thing is that you need to always, my advice is always go to a larger consulate. For instance, when people are in the U.S. and they want to get out of the U.S. to go do their consular processing as quickly as possible, they'll go to Canada or they'll go to Mexico where there are lots of U.S. consulates. If you're going to do that, go to one of the large ones in Mexico, Mexico City, Ciudad Juarez, in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec. Don't go to these small consulates where they may have an open visa appointment, but there's one, two, maybe three visa officers there. They don't see that many cases, so they don't have the same amount of experience, which means they don't have the same amount of knowledge or confidence when dealing with cases. So if you've got anything in your case that would cause them alarm or to have to second guess themselves, it's not going to go well in a small consulate. Always aim for a bigger one if you can. Marie Antoinette asks, if there is a high chance visa can be approved for B1B2 if the family is applying. That has an effect, right? <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that it's better or worse, right? It's not that individuals have a higher chance than families or families have a higher chance than individuals, no. 
But you should know that when you go in for a family interview, the other family members will affect the way that the visa officer thinks about you. Sometimes there may be a family where four members of the family seem to be great visa applicants, but then there's one uncle that's in the group who has no job, no income, no education, and has never traveled outside of his country, has no prospects at all. It may result in just that uncle being refused their visa and everyone else being issued, or that uncle's uh, lack of qualifications may contaminate the entire group and lead the entire group to be refused. So think about that deeply before you decide to go in with a group. Okay, the F-1 visa, Rick Sanchez says, F-1 visa was rejected. Is there any chance to apply again and how? Yes, you can apply again. If you were just rejected under 214B because the visa officer did not think that you had the right credentials that one time, that does not mean you can't get your visa again. I don't know the details of your situation, so I don't know what would support your application more than, than, than what you, you presented in your last application. But technically, from that point of view, yes, you can still apply again and get your visa. Ma Camial pregunta en, ¿debo hablar en inglés en mi entrevista? Pues depende de, del tipo de visa que está solicitando. Si está solicitando una visa de turista, no, no es necesario hablar en inglés. Puedes hablar en español y sí, está bien. Pero si está solicitando una visa de estudiante, sí, claro que sí, tienes que hablar en inglés porque los que estudian en Estados Unidos tienen que hablar en inglés, tienen que estudiar en inglés. Entonces es muy importante que enseñas al oficial que tú sí puedes hablar en, en inglés uh, para, para apoyar tu, tu, tu solicitud, ¿ok? I hope that helps. My Spanish is not perfect, but I hope that answers your question. Ok, C1D visa rejected under 214B for the second time. A C1D visa is a crew or transit visa. I'm assuming that your crew, uh, most people don't apply for that for transit, they would just apply for a B1, B2. But if you're a flight crew or ship crew, then you would apply for this type of visa. The key with that is your employment, is showing your stable, continued, and uh, lasting employment with your employer in your career as a sailor or as uh, tripulation on a, on a plane. Whatever it may be, you need to show that to them when you're applying. Uh, if you're new to the industry, that could be a problem for you. Or if you've misused it in the past, it could be a problem for you. Does EB3 visa require you to be employed before the interview? This is a very good question, Telly Bean XO. No, you do not have to be employed before. In fact, it would be impossible for you to be employed before if you're working, if you're abroad and applying for your EB3 visa. Then you're applying for the visa to go and arrive in the U.S. and do that job in the U.S. Now, many people apply for an EB3 visa while already in the U.S., let's say on an F visa. Then it is a very good idea to start that job as early as possible. The best because what, what, is, what is the visa officer or the immigration official thinking when you are applying for an EB3? What are they considering? They're considering, is this person going to do this job? Because many times the job is beneath their credentials, beneath their professional qualifications. They may be an engineer and they're applying to do janitorial work or food preparation work. And so the, the, the official is concerned that this person's not really going to do that job, right? If you are already doing that job, especially if you've already been doing that job for a number of months, that is the greatest evidence you have to prove that you will indeed do this job that you would get the visa for. Mirembe Brown says, can I explain about the K visa? What to do to get approval? How long it takes is a different question. I'll talk about getting it approved though. The K visa is a fiance visa. It is a non-American who's going to marry an American. They're not married yet, and they're applying for a visa that technically is a non-immigrant visa. However, it's interviewed in the immigrant visa section, and those are the types of standards that are applied to it. 
Why would they refuse one of these visas? The main reason was, would be because they do not believe in the legitimacy of your relationship. Why is this? Because there are many people around the world that get into fraudulent relationships for the sole purpose of obtaining an immigration benefit, i.e. a visa. So they are looking at you and your relationship and they're trying to determine, okay, is this one of these fake relationships or is this one of these real relationships? They don't know. They have no way of knowing. So if you go in and you just don't say anything, if you answer the questions very shortly, Yes, I met my husband a year ago. We're going to get married next month, right? These questions don't bring any new information to the visa officer to let them know we have a real relationship. So what you have to do is bring your relationship to life, right? The same way that you would be speaking to, let's say a cousin, and you're telling your cousin that you're going to get married and you've met this person. That's the way that you need to speak to the visa officer when you're in your K-Visa interview. Okay, there's a person, great, you, you wanna switch from an F1 to a J1? Yes, you can do that. You don't have to ask that question anymore. Okay, appreciate you pasting that in there about 30 times. <clears throat> I pay visa fee from India, now US consulate is closed. Unfortunately, that is the case. The US consulate embassy will never give a refund at all. They don't even have the ability to. Uh, so you cannot get a refund. You say, can I attend the interview in KSA? I, I do not know what KSA is. Let's just assume you're talking about another country. Yes, yes you can, but that visa fee does not transfer. It's only applicable in India. Unfortunately, that is the case. If my son's mom passed away while in the U.S., can he apply for citizenship? He's a minor. I'm very sorry to hear that your son's mom passed away. Uh, just because she was in the U.S. when she passed away does not give him any special status. Um, if she was a foreign national in the U.S. when she passed away, that doesn't help him at all. If she was a citizen then there's the possibility he's already a citizen. This is a complex question, which I would need to get a lot more information from you before I would be able to answer clearly. H1B, can I get from Canada or need to travel to home country? Well, I don't know what your home country is. You haven't told me, but I can assume it's not Canada. This just goes back to what I've reiterated time after time here on this live. Yes, you can apply in other countries. Your chances will not be as good as if you apply in your own country. If you must apply in Canada, Canada does see many third country nationals, that's non-Canadians, applying for visas there. So it is a good place to apply. However, go to one of the larger consulates. Go to one of the larger ones. Toronto. Montreal, Vancouver. Don't go to a small one. If you go to a small one, there is the chance that you'll encounter someone who's very inexperienced and is uh, needlessly overexcitable about seeing somebody from another country, and then you might get hassled. Yes, you are from India, so yes. It would be best to go back to India, but because the visa appointments are very difficult to get right now, yes, you can do it in Canada. Is a person more likely to be denied if they have no stamps on their passport? Asks Miss Kia34. Across the board, yes. And that's because it shows that someone has no prior travel. Just because you have no stamps, it doesn't matter. The visa officers, not, they're not dumb. They don't look at a, pa a passport that was issued two months ago and they don't, they don't think, oh, well, if there's no stamps here, there must be never traveled before. If you traveled previously, on another passport, bring that passport to the interview with you. Show them that passport. 
if they in the country where you are they collect those passports and they don't give it back to you you still write in the ds-160 all the names of the countries that you've traveled to previously right so they, they they see all this you may think that the visa interview goes very quickly and so they don't see all that information i did sixty thousand visa interviews sixty thousand over the course of my time there it becomes they become very good at accessing the information that they need to access it doesn't mean that they're very good at making the correct decision, but at getting to the information that they're trying to get to, they're very fast. They open up your DS-160, and in seriously, one, two, three, four, they see all the information that they need, right? They see your, they see your age, they see uh, your purpose of travel, they see your, uh, your work, your employment, they see your education history, they see, and they see your travel history, and they see if you've been arrested. Right? They see all that in such a short amount of time. They're seeing what you're writing in there, right? So you can rely on that. I was deported 10 years ago. Can I get a visa? It depends on the type of de deportation. If you were deported um, just from the border when you were trying to enter the U.S., then you have a five-year ban normally unless they allow you to withdraw your application for admission. After 10 years, that ban has expired and you can reapply. However, the visa officer will see that you were deported before and that still will affect their thinking about you in the visa interview. So you need to be prepared to counter that because 10 years have passed. Your life is different now. Your situation is different. Your circumstances are different. Your finances are different. Your family, you may have a family now. You may have children. Something's changed now that that you need to use to prove to them that you will not get deported again for whatever caused your deportation the first time. Anaid Leva says, I'm Mexican and want the visa because I want to travel to New York and Disney. Can I get the visa? Indeed you can. Uh, you just have to qualify just like everyone else will need to when they're in the visa interview. And what does qualifying mean? It means proving that you will come back to Mexico after your trip to the United States. Okay. If I'm half German, asks EJHM, is it easier to get a visa in my Mexican passport? When you say you're half German, do you mean that you have German nationality as well? If you have a German passport, please use your German passport to travel to the U.S. The reason is because German passports are visa waiver. You do not need to get a visa. You can just go online and you fill out the ESTA form and you're able to travel to the U.S. If when you say that you're half German, you just mean that you have German heritage, but you do not have any German citizenship or passport, then no, it doesn't matter. They, they, don't, they, they don't care about your, your heritage. They care about the passports and the rights that are associated with those passports when you're applying for your visa. Dequavis59 says, I left the U.S. on my own when I was underage. Can I get a student visa? Yes, you can. There's no ban on you because you were a minor when you were in the US, and I'm assuming, I'm just gonna make the assumption because I don't know, um, but I'm gonna make the assumption that you, you were there without, uh, without status. You didn't have the right visa for what you were doing there or what your parents were doing there. You said that you left on your own when you were underage. So you won't be held accountable, accountable legally for that overstate, for that, that unlawful state, but it's your family and your family reflects on you and that information will still affect the consular officer's thinking when you go in for, for your visa interview. You're still going to have to prove to them that you're not going to do the same thing that your parents had done before when you were underage. Hi, I was married, says EcoGirl07, to an American for 15 years, but not living in the USA. Can I apply for citizenship? You say, you're using the past tense there. I was married. Does that mean you're not married anymore? Eco girl 07. If you are not married to them anymore, then no, you have no way to get citizenship. Having previously been married to an American citizen, 
does not give you any special status. Uh, if you're still married, then yes, you can apply for a green card. Having a marriage to a U.S. citizen is one of the ways that you can qualify for a green card visa, an immigrant visa. Someone is a U.S. citizen saying that they plan on marrying a Mexican national with a visitor visa. What are my options? It's not against the rules to get married on a visitor visa. In fact, it says explicitly in the regulations that if you're planning to get married in America and then return abroad to a residence abroad, you should use a tourist visa. However, the visa officers do not know this. If there's any visa officers that are watching today, please check the regulations. If someone is going to get married in the U.S. and then return back abroad to their residence because they and their U.S. citizen spouse intend to reside abroad, a B visa is the correct visa to do that on. K visas are only for arriving in the U.S., getting married in the U.S., and then residing in the U.S. Anything else is a B visa. See if we can find any <clears throat> good question. What is the I-212 waiver form? That's the consent to reapply. For certain ineligibilities, including being deported, you have to get consent to reapply. You need an I-212. For immigrant visas, this is the actual form that you fill out. Your lawyer will most likely do it for you. They'll fill this out, and it allows you to reapply for admission to the U.S. However... If you have one of these ineligibilities and you apply for a non-immigrant visa, you don't need one of these. The consent to reapply is satisfied by the visa officer requesting a waiver for you. I just had a case where I was helping someone who went into their interview. The visa officer wanted to give them a waiver, but the visa officer didn't know their own regulations and told the, the tourist visa applicant that they needed to get an I-212 waiver. But that's not the case. Luckily, I was able to pull some, we won't call it magic, so we'll say some administrative um, sorcery. And by getting in touch with a congressman in the U.S. and submitting a congressional inquiry with this information about how the regulations were not correctly adhered to, we were, get the, we were able to get the visa office in that country to overturn that visa officer's decision and say, actually, you're right, this was a procedural mistake that wasn't in accordance with the regulations and we're going to fix this. So, there you go, I-212 waivers. What are the main reasons why an applicant on spousal visa gets denied? Well, let's see, spousal visa, this could be an immigrant visa, in which case the only reason that you would just get denied without having an ineligibility, like an overstay, like a misrepresentation, like a having committed a crime, is if they don't believe your relationship is real. That's the reason why they might deny your spouse visa, is that they think that you and your spouse have a fake relationship just to get the visa, and they'll refuse it for that reason. What are the reasons for EB-3 visa denial? In the same way, there's all the, the standard reasons like having been convicted of a crime, um, misrepresentation, all these things that could be on your record in the past. But the main one for an EB-3 visa, if everything else is all right, it's that they don't believe you're going to do the job. That's the main thing with the EB-3 visa. If they don't think you're going to do the job, they will not issue your visa. Ankita asks us, I am on a work visa in Canada. What are my chances to get a tourist visa? This should be pretty good, honestly. If you've got, if you're in a legal status in Canada, 
as a student or uh, as, a, as, a, as a, with an employment visa, you have a good chance of getting your US visa. But again, don't be passive in your visa interview. Be very proactive, talk about your situation, show them your credentials verbally rather than documentarily, and you should be able to get your visa. Judy says, saludos de Mexico. Hola, hola a todos los amigos mexicanos. If I'm deported from the US, do I have a chance to enter UK or Australia? Rosh, there is intelligence sharing between the five eyes, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. And so there is a good chance that that information will be available to those other countries and it will affect your immigration chances to those countries. It doesn't mean that they will refuse you because they have different laws. I don't know the UK or Australian laws, but they will know that this happened in the US and they will consider it uh, with regards to their own immigration laws. I have an H2B visa. Can I apply for a B1, B2 visa for my son? Yes, you can. There's nothing that says that the children of H2B visa holders cannot apply for B visas for their children, for their minor children. However, the H2, A, H2B visas are not high income visas. And based on that economic situation, they may be unlikely to want to approve your minor children's visas because that would give you less of a reason to leave the US once your work is done. Hello to you 75 says, I'm living in Saudi, having B1, B2, my family here on visit, can they apply visa for them in Saudi? I will, I don't know what country you're from, you failed to tell me that. However, yes, you can apply anywhere, but you always have to remember, it seems like we keep going back to this over and over, you, you will have lower chances outside of your home country, okay? Now, there are exceptions that we talked about. Here's another exception. What if your home country is India, but you've lived in Dubai for 30 years? Yes, you can definitely apply for your visa there in Dubai where you've been resident for 30 years. It's not going to be a problem for you to do that. You can apply there because you have such strong ties. You've been there for a long time. Ostensibly, you have property, you have your finances, you have your career, your entire life has been there. You can apply there and it won't be a problem. When you're temporarily in another country, that's when you need to go back to your home country where that's where your ties are, that's where you can apply and you're going to have a much better chance of getting the visa. Okay. 3194 says that you, they were rejected for a student visa, saying that they will not return to their home country should you reapply. That's one of those cases where you can still reapply. You can reapply. There's nothing that's stopping you from re reapplying, but they will see that negative information as soon as you apply again. They'll see that negative information and it will affect their thinking. And so what you have to be ready to do is to give them some different information, something that's gonna change their thinking from negative to positive. All right, we'll answer one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. We're, we're about at an hour right now. Manpreet Kaur. <clears throat> I lied on my B1, B2 visa application, but they still gave me the 214 visa slip. Will it affect my F1 visa interview? Yes, it will. Okay, there are different levels of committing fraud. The most grievous is 61 material misrepresentation. That means that you lied about something on your application that was material to their decision on whether or not you qualified for that visa. That's just a very fancy way of saying you lied about something important, right? Let's say that you lied about your, um, the, your, your, your plans to study at the university. You lied about uh, the funding that you had for the university, these types of things. Now, if you lied about um, something that wasn't directly related to studying, let's say that you uh, you, you said that you'd been to Japan on vacation, but you actually never had been. That is definitely still a lie. However, it's not to the bar of material misrepresentation. And so the visa officers will still put in the notes 
this applicant has lied, but they will not give you the material misrepresentation in eligibility. Future visa officers are always going to look back and see those prior notes, and they're going to see that the previous visa officer says that you lied. That's going to have a very negative effect on any future visa application. Uh, however, you don't have that permanent bar. So let's say that five years, 10 years have passed. Then you can go into another visa interview and expressing contrition, saying, I'm sorry for this. Yes, I did it. It was wrong. I'm sorry. Then they can reissue your visa after that. Okay. That's going to be it for today, everybody. This was our first TikTok live here from Argo Visa. I'm Ben. Uh, the thing that I want to leave everyone with is that if you need help with your visa, I hope that you go through our entire page and look at all the videos that we've got. We're throwing out all the wisdom, all the knowledge that we have that is generally applicable to visa applicants from all over the world in our videos. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you need personalized, customized help. If that's the case, get in touch with us. In our bio, in our profile, you get the link to our website. You can sign up for a consultation with me, with Mandy, who you also see in our videos, and with our entire stable of consular officers who have now left the department, and we're all ready to help people who are applying for their visas. We've worked in 35 countries. We speak 15 different languages, which means we most likely speak your language too. We can help you get your visas issued. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Hope you have a great day.